Good, uh, good morning. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's uh, Minister of Health. Uh, to my uh, right, to your left, is Michelle Mongal, who is the Minister for Jobs, Economic Development and Competitiveness. I think I got that right. Yeah, it's a long title. That's it. And most importantly, the member for Nelson Creston, the MLA for Nelson Creston. On the phone with us is the Parliamentary Secretary for Seniors, uh, Ronna Ray Leonard, the MLA for the Comox Valley and the CEO and President of Interior Health, Susan Brown, who's just been doing an extraordinary job during this time of pandemic. We're honored to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people of the, the uh, Squamalt and the Songhees First Nations. And um, I want to just let you know what's going to happen here, that uh, I'm going to say a few words. I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Ron Ray Leonard, then Susan Brown, who are going to speak uh, remotely. And then we're going to close with M Michelle uh, Mungal, who will speak for a little bit, and then I'll come back and take uh, questions, should there be any, about the announcement or other things from the media. Uh, as all of you know, uh, long-term care has been a central priority of mine, of the government since 2017, uh, in our health care system. And you can see that in the actions taken. When I became Minister of Health, 87% of care homes did not meet provincial standards for staffing and a huge number of them, some 90 care homes were dramatically below standard uh, at that time. So uh, at the time there were 90 care homes with uh, uh, less than 3.0 hours per resident day, uh, which was dramatically below the standard, which is 3.36. Just to put that in context, what that means, that means almost two hours a week per resident below care standard. And we've taken action to correct that. So at the end of this year, the provincial average will be will meet the provincial standard for the first time since those standards were applied. And I think that's a real achievement in public health care. Of course, we got rid of bills 29 and 94, which uh, negatively affected care staff. We've recruited and are training more uh, care aides than ever before and increasing uh, the, as we increase uh, staffing in our care homes. And since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, we've implemented a single site order. Uh, that, that meant assigning 8,848 healthcare workers who are at multiple sites to one site, but also raising um, the wages of everyone across the sector to what's called the negotiated standard, the HEABC standard, which makes a significant difference for healthcare workers and will continue to improve in recruiting. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we announced the new visitor policy that uh, allows for visits during this time of pandemic and long-term care. And that policy was supported by direct supports to care home to improve infection control and to improve supports and to allow those visitors programs to go ahead. So these are all significant changes. Before the pandemic, we often talked about a real challenge in our system, which is that we have a, a growing seniors population. Just to give you an example of that, in interior health there are going to be 28 percent more people over 75 in five years than there are today. That is a substantial, enormous increase in the number of people over 75. Not seniors over 65, but over 75, which is obviously the largest group of people in terms of long-term care. So what are we announcing today? We're announcing in the Interior Health Authority, with a growing seniors population, 495 new long-term care beds. That's 140 beds in Kelowna, that's 100 in Kamloops, that's 90 in Penticton, that's 90 in Vernon, that's 75 in Nelson. Minister Mangel's going to talk about Nelson. Yeah. Uh, for 495 beds, which is a significant, uh, obviously significant increase on the base, the current base, of roughly 6,000 beds across Interior Health. This is, as I say, um, significant. Across those five uh, communities, we're going to be uh, we're announcing and releasing today requests for proposals for those beds. Those proposals will come out forward in the fall. They'll be assessed in the fall, and announcements on the successful proponents will be made in December. And in all of those communities, that will increase significantly, and then we'll start building in the beginning of 2021. So across those communities, you're going to see significant improvements in care. We need to address the issue of long-term care, and we're doing it by improving staffing, improving standards, improving working conditions, and, and across British Columbia, increasing the number of beds. 
I think this is important as long-term care changes and as the challenge of long-term care in our society changes. And so I'm very proud of this announcement today. It's happening. It's happening now. The RFP is out. The beds are coming. And, uh, and uh, the process is in place. And uh, as I say, this is a significant day. COVID-19 has demonstrated to us, uh, obviously, the central vulnerability in this time, in this particular time, uh, to, of people living in long-term care, people working in long-term care, but principally living in long-term care, to this infection for which there's no vaccine and no cure. But we also have a broader question of improving care standards and ensuring that all of us in the future have access to the care we need when we need it. That's not just about long-term care, of course. It's about home support. It's about respite care. It's about supports in communities. It's about adult day programs. In short, and what is fundamental to me, is not that just that we have long-term care homes like these new 495 we're going to be have that all of those beds are going to be single bedrooms, that all of those beds are going to meet provincial standards for staffing. All of those things are important. But also that we, throughout our lives, as we live longer, especially as seniors from the age of 65 onward, our life expectancy continues to rise, that we continue not just to live longer and be supported in that and kept safe in that, but that we live well. And having new long-term care beds, this significant number in the Interior Health Authority is going to make a big difference in that. So with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over remotely to the Parliamentary Secretary for Seniors, Ronna Ray Leonard, to say a few words. Ronna Ray? Okay, thank you, Minister Dix. It's an exciting day, and I just uh, let you know that I'm calling from the traditional territories of the Comox First Nation. And uh, absolutely, the COVID-19 pandemic has been incredibly diff difficult for British Columbians, and its impact on our everyday lives is profound. Together, we are showing the world that with commitment and with care for one another, we can weather the unprecedented challenges that COVID-19 has brought to our doorstep. This pandemic has thrown into sharp relief the need for leadership, that is fully committed to strengthening our public health care and senior care system. As, as Minister Dix has said, the investments we made to raise care standards across BC made an important difference when we were met with the unexpected. And then prior to 2017, the standard of care for long-term care had been set for over a decade and was never achieved. In 2018, we set the goal to increase staffing levels in long-term care homes and raise the standard of care for seniors and residents across the province. We put in place an action plan to meet that goal, anchored by one of the largest investments in seniors care in the province's history. By 2020, this has meant better working conditions and benefits for health care workers and AIDS. Hundreds of frontline care providers were converted from casual and part-time to full-time positions, providing caregivers with stability and the help they need to provide seniors with compassionate, timely care. This has meant that seniors and residents who most need it will re receive help with bathing, feeding, and socializing. This is the difference our commitment has made for frontline care providers and for our seniors. There's more to do. Today's announcement is a further step in a series of substantive actions that our government has taken to improve and strengthen seniors' care in our province. Investing in long-term care will help recruit a new generation of health care professionals to the interior region, making sure that seniors can get the care they need to age well and with dignity for years to come. And now I'd like to introduce next speaker, President and CEO of the Interior Health Authority, Susan Brown. On behalf of Interior Health, I would like to recognize and acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Silix Nation, where we are privileged to live, learn, collaborate, and work together. Taking care of our seniors and elders is of utmost importance. These are our parents, our family members, our knowledge keepers, and they have contributed to our communities throughout their entire life. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how important our long-term care system is and how important it is that we continue to strengthen it. 
Long-term care is a key component of the spectrum of services provided to seniors across interior health and the services that also include home nursing, adult day programs and supports for managing chronic disease such as diabetes, kidney care and cardiac health. When the time comes for seniors to need the supports of long-term care, we must be able to provide those needs. Our population is ageing and we're anticipating, as the Minister pointed out, that Interior Health Region will grow by 28% seniors in the next five years. That's why we're planning and preparing now for the more people needing long-term care and the increased demand that will be on our system. COVID-19 has had significant impact on seniors and we know that it's been especially challenging for those living in long-term care and for their families. We are committed to taking what we've learned over the past several months and applying it to these projects, strategies and approaches that make the care environment safe and patient-centred, even through challenging circumstances like our current pandemic. We're at the beginning of the process and requests for proposals will be released today for new beds in Kamloops, Kelowna, Vernon, Penticton and Nelson. Together, these requests for proposals represent 495 new beds across Interior Region. We looked at many factors when determining where to locate these projects, including population projections, wait times for admissions, the complexity of people needing care, as well as local and regional demographics. In each of the communities, we will also work closely with our partners, including local First Nations and municipal and regional governments. I'm very grateful for those relationships we have and that together we will work toward new long-term care facilities that are culturally safe and which meet local needs. We are looking forward to awarding these contracts to the successful proponents in early 2021. Thank you, Minister Dix, for your ongoing support and commitment to improving care for seniors in British Columbia. Now I'd like to introduce the Minister of Jobs, Economic Development and Competitiveness, uh, Michelle Mungo, the MLA for Nelson Creston. Thank you very much, Susan. I have a big, huge ear-to-ear grin, and uh, Adrian, I'm so glad you get to see it because this smile is uh, on the faces of everybody in Nelson and no doubt on the faces of everybody in all the communities that are getting long-term care beds today. But for my community in particular, this is more than just an announcement for a need that is so desperately felt in our community but rather this is the realization of a vision well over 20 years. And I know that Adrian, you know the details of that vision because we've talked about it a lot over the years. And to be here today with you, with our government, I am so very, very proud, so proud to be at this announcement for this vision, making it a reality for Nelson today. We know that in Nelson, we need long-term care beds. And we know that these beds, this facility needs to be part of a community. It needs to be part of a campus of care. And that that's what we're delivering today meets that vision. It makes it a reality. And it is so very exciting for our community. I want to just quickly acknowledge the important work that laid the foundation years and years ago by the Sisters of St. Anne with the vision for Mount St. Francis to make sure that that land stayed with the purpose for health care services for our community. Their long vision started many decades ago, continues on with the work that our government is doing, that you're doing, Adrian, and that with this announcement today. Not only are we going to be seeing the long-term care beds, as I said, but we're looking at a campus, a healthcare campus, where we're looking at housing, we're looking at healthcare services that can expand as needs for seniors grow. We're looking at maybe looking at uh, a childcare center in the location. All of this coming together shows that it's not about seniors off outside of the community, but rather in the community with the community so that we're all together. We're growing from birth to the last years of life and we're all together caring for each other. The vision that was started in Nelson and is now being realized today with this announcement, I wanna thank all of those who have worked on this 
for many, many, many years. I want to thank you, Adrian, for coming in and helping us make it a reality. This is a really good day for Nelson. This is a really good day for the Kootenays and a really good day for all the communities in the interior that are going to get better long-term care for our loved ones, our seniors, and our communities. Thank you so much. All right, pass it back to you. Thank you very much, Michelle. And uh, now uh, I think we're opening the floor uh, to questions. There you are. I could have not, not up there, but over there. I got you. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, as a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow up only. I would also ask that you please take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question this morning is from Keith Baldry, Global News. Hi, Minister Dix, thanks for taking my question. I just want to ask you uh, for an update on the Kelowna situation. Um, is it true that this involved private parties of young people at these resorts? And how was this outbreak uh, first discovered? Was it, uh, I understand it was from uh, contact tracing from a case, a positive case uh, that was located in Metro Van Vancouver? Yeah, first of all, this uh, shows what we do uh, with contract, contact tracing uh, in BC. And the contact tracing in question here now involves uh, um, uh, three health authorities in British Columbia, Interior Health, obviously, in Kelowna, Fraser Health, and Vancouver Coastal Health. And yet, this is the process, this is the work, almost the detective work, of, uh, of public health and our outstanding uh, health team in Interior Health and in the other health authorities who pursue cases identify cases and identify contacts and that's what's happened in this case so it, indeed uh, the cases involve people uh, in Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraserville through the contact tracing process um, obviously was linked to uh, to Kelowna and uh, to the community there uh, and I think it's important to recognize we of course there are, um, we've raised issues around four sites in Kelowna and uh, two uh, resort hotels there, but the the main inciting incident it would appear is uh, were private parties held in those uh, in those resort hotels, and so I think I think the message to everybody is pretty clear. I want to give a lot of credit to people in Kelowna, particularly the businesses in Kelowna, who have been in uh, in tourism doing a very good job in a, in a general sense, both in restaurants and tourism, in addressing uh, the needs of keeping uh, tourists and everybody safe in Kelowna. But when people come together for private parties, in this case it's largely people in their 20s and 30s, um, the risks are considerably higher. They tend to be in enclosed uh, spaces. They tend to involve people coming from different places, different walks of life who may not know each other at all. And the risks of those kinds of events are higher. It's why we have uh, uh, limits on the overall sizes of gatherings, organized gatherings. But people, I think, have to show um, good judgment with respect to events. When I walk around my constituency in Vancouver Kingsway, frequently I'm finding people in the front lawn, physically distanced, having kind of a new form of party where we're often around in a circle and people are keeping apart. But a private party, uh, it might or it might not involve alcohol, it makes it very difficult to maintain physical distance, to know who you're about. You're essentially uh, and potentially, if you're going to such a party, significantly increasing your bubble. So I want people to remember how cautious they need to be. And that, you know, just in my case, we, I live uh, in an apartment between 800 and 900 square feet. Well, a reasonable size for any event where I might invite people, the maximum number of people that I would probably invite in such a space in my living room would be uh, four people. And so this is the risk of that, and we have to acknowledge that. We also have to acknowledge that people have fully involved themselves in the contact tracing process, and that this is a worldwide pandemic, and we see in other jurisdictions around British Columbia how many cases we see. And what I'm suggesting to people is we can travel, but we have to be as respectful of where we travel as we are our home community. We can do things out in the world, but we have to be conscious of physical distancing. And if we're going to engage and have uh, events that bring people together in enclosed circumstances, in private parties, we have to be conscious both of the risks 
not just a risk to ourselves, but to our parents, to our grandparents, to people we might know who have chronic diseases, such as diabetes, and act accordingly. And I think uh, that's the lesson in this case. Uh, as you know, we announced, I believe, uh, connected to this on Friday, eight cases. We'll be announcing the case numbers uh, at 3 o'clock this afternoon by a written statement from myself and Dr. Henry. And, uh, and uh, we'll see what the numbers are then. Do you have a follow-up, Keith? Yes. Um, is it not incumbent on these resorts to prevent, uh, to prevent these private parties from occurring? I'm not sure exactly what the physical dimensions were, whether they were all in a room or something, but uh, isn't it the res responsibility of these facilities to ensure this doesn't happen? Well, my, my, my message, first of all, my message, first of all, is to people, because if you own, own a space, whether you rent a space, you own a space, and you're having a party, you have obligations, too. You have responsibilities, too. And if you're going to go and accept an invitation to such an event, you have to keep the risks of that in mind. And that's an important consideration, because while these particular uh, private parties occurred in resort hotels that were being effectively rented for a short duration stay, um, there are parties that will take place in people's homes and apartments all the time. And we have got to live with COVID-19 for the, for the next year. So that means the responsibility is on all of us, I think, to understand the risks and to understand our responsibility to one another and act accordingly. I think people in BC overwhelmingly, especially when I walk around uh, Vancouver Kingsway, Keith, uh, people are responding very positively to this. But we have to understand that, that uh, even though we've done much, much better than other jurisdictions and our cases, I think on Friday, we had our, our highest number of new cases for some time and it was 25, but that's not, as we know, in jurisdictions near us, in the hundreds, or indeed in the thousands, in some cases, some jurisdictions in North America. But it's still with us. It's still in the Interior Health Authority. It's still in our health authority across the province, and we need to act accordingly. Next question is from Tyler Harper, Nelson Starr. Hi there. This question is for Susan Brown. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for doing this today. Uh, Minister Mangal mentioned um, Mount Saint Francis, uh, which is a facility here at Nelson that has been uh, unused for quite some time. And I'm curious to know if today's announcement is in, is at all related to possible uses of that site. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, great. Um, yes, uh, we are looking to uh, use a piece of that land um, and um, work with partners to ensure that, uh, as we've mentioned, that the building is state-of-the-art for seniors and it's in a, a great place in Nelson. So, um, yes, that will be part of the plan. And just to follow up, if you will, too, um, in 2017, Interior Health told us that it had made a request for proposals for a 43-bed facility uh, to be built in Nelson, um, but the initiative ended up being scrapped because uh, no applicants had been found. Do you expect this, uh, this to be different this time, and why would that be? Yes, we've increased the number of beds there, so it seems a, a more economical, viable uh, option for somebody to come forward. So um, we think we'll be successful this time, and we've been having discussions locally with people, and um, we are poised for success on this one. Um, uh, yes, 43 to 75 beds. This is also uh, a, a design-build finance proposal. The intention is for IH, uh, Interior Health, to lease the new facility from the proponent and operate both long-term care and community services. So that's a significant change. Uh, the, in this case, we'll not be requiring proponents to provide the land required for the project, as you uh, noted in your question. So the intention here is uh, to provide more beds, but to also meet the need for community services, as Minister Mungal said, which is uh, really an exciting proposal for Nelson. Next question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Hi there. Uh, this message is also, or this question is also for Susan Brown. Um, a farm workers advocacy group says there's been a positive COVID-19 test at an Oliver uh, farm company. Uh, first of all, can you confirm, and can you talk about what precautions have been taken to protect others, uh, workers at the farm? Thanks. Yes, I can confirm there has been a case, and as Minister Dix highlighted, there'll be some additional information available this afternoon. 
There is an investigation where some of our teams have been uh, on site locally to help and ensure that people get any care they require. And the details of that will be um, made public this afternoon through Minister Dix and uh, Bonnie Henry. And just as a follow-up, um, this advocate says the worker who tested positive was isolated in substandard conditions with no food uh, provided by the employer. What is the health authority's role in making sure that employers are providing safe living and, and working conditions for migrant farm workers, especially during the pandemic? And, and maybe the health minister wants to weigh in on that as well. Thank you. I, I cannot comment until our team was involved, but my understanding is the workers being very well looked after and uh, is having the appropriate medical care and social care that he requires to recover. And um, as I say, there's a, a team on site uh, that are helping and obviously additional information will become available later today. Yeah, and just to say that I think what's unique um, about what we've done in British Columbia is, of course, uh, when people come to British Columbia, there's been uh, there's been an active uh, quarantine here uh, that's not on the site of uh, of farms, and the result of that has been um, uh, since the uh, the outbreak that occurred in Kelowna in the, at the beginning of April, uh, we haven't up to this point had. Uh, uh, outbreaks on uh, farms in BC. In fact, there have been 27 cases of positive tests for COVID-19 within the quarantine, but that quarantine has happened largely in uh, hotels in Vancouver Coastal Health. So we've uh, paid a lot of attention to this uh, in BC to do things uh, differently. Obviously, whenever, just as the case um, that we talked about in, uh, in Kelowna, just in that case, there's a full health investigation going on to pursue uh, any contacts people may have had and we'll uh, have more information for that in our statement at three o'clock. Mike Potestio, CAMLIPS this week. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Uh, just wanted to see if you guys can get us, give us a breakdown of uh, how many new long-term care facilities those 100 beds for CAMLIPS will create and, and where in town uh, you want to set them up. So, um, so the number in uh, in Kamloops is 100 uh, new beds, and uh, the the location will be determined uh, during the uh, request for proposal process. The process that's been set up in Nelson is different than the other four communities, but uh, uh, I it would be my expectation, given the the sizes and the economies of scale, that those uh, 100 uh, beds would likely be located on one site and that the site that will be selected will be selected in the in the RFP process just as it will be in Vernon and in Penticton for the 90 beds in those two communities, 90 in each of those two communities and the 140 beds in central Okanagan and Kelowna. Do you have a follow-up, Mike? Yeah, uh, the follow-up would be then uh, just um, Susan mentioned that there were a number of factors that went into the breakdown of those 495 what factors factor into the 20% uh, of the beds that camels will be getting? Oh, I, I think all of the ones that um, that uh, that Susan talked about, and she can answer in more detail in a moment. But I think uh, what this reflects is existing numbers of beds in those communities and the demand in all of those communities, including um, the demand of the population over 75. Um, which is a growing population really everywhere in the Interior Health Authority and in the Northern Health Authority. And we're not talking, about, by the way, about the growth in the population over 65, but over 75, which is largely the population served by long-term care beds, which is significant. So obviously that population is growing in Kamloops. It's why um, uh, Kamloops has 100 beds, which is a significant increase in their bed levels. But I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Susan. Thanks, Minister Dix. Um, so yes, looking obviously at population growth is an important factor and where we where we see wait times for admission, and then uh, also the complexity of people going into uh, care need care and what care they actually need. There is a subset of population that may have dementia or other specific care needs where the environment might have to look a little bit different. So really analyzing the population, what we see as trends and where there's uh, need, we will tailor the build towards that population. Thank you. Next question is from Angela Jones, CTV. 
Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, this is also a question regarding the Kelowna outbreak. I just wanted to, I saw that the BC CDC flagged a flight from Kelowna to Vancouver on July 6th. Is that related to the people who went to the private party? I, I don't know, but I can, uh, I can get that information for you. Do you have a follow-up, Angela? Great, yes. I guess my follow-up question would be uh, clarification in terms of the people who are told to self-isolate and those who are told to self-monitor their symptoms. So the people who went to the resorts, they're told to self-isolate. Uh, how about those who went to the Cactus Club and Pace Spin Studio? How did someone from one of the parties go to those two places? Well, I, I think in the contact tracing, uh, that is what was determined by Interior Health. And so those two locations um, were added, uh, Cactus Club and the Spin Studio were added uh, to the resorts. But you'll note in the, in the advisory from internal, Interior Health the distinction between the two, that people who attended the gatherings at the resort, not the resort, but the gatherings at the resort uh, in, on those days, are being asked to self-isolate and those uh, that w were at the Cactus Club obviously in those conditions are being told to monitor their circumstances if they feel at all able to get themselves uh, tested and so that that's a distinction between uh, obviously a distinction and a judgment made by the by the public health officials and interior health and the, the BCCDC as to the the level of risk. Next question is from Claudia Van Emmerich, Global, Global Okanagan. Hi, thank you. Hi, Mr. Dix. Um, just to follow up again to the Kelowna questions that are being asked, I wanted to ask you um, if sort of what's going on with the cluster of cases, does this change your advice at all or your stance on travel and tourism? Uh, it strengthens the advice that we consistently give about, uh, especially about people coming together and gathering and about what happens when you travel in the province, that you have to behave and follow the uh, advice, uh, the counsel, and in some cases the rules being provided uh, by Dr. Henry and public health officials across the province. And we're going to be dealing with this for uh, months and months and months to come. And so it is critically important, especially when people gather, especially when they gather in private residences or private parties, that those rules be followed in those circumstances. And I think it's important to understand that just in general, uh, the most likely people we're going to transmit this virus to if we become positive to COVID-19 are people that we love. And that should be reason to inspire us to follow the rules, right? So it is possible. Uh, to be safe and in restaurants we have work safe and we have public health uh, rules that are being put in place and plans laid out and so on. It is possible to do that and it is possible to travel but that doesn't take away from the fact that we're living in a time of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and whether we travel or whether we're at home, whether we're going to a party when we're on a trip or whether we're going to a party at home, the same concerns, the same risks apply and we have to, um, we have to follow that and again uh, this isn't to make people's lives uh, uh, less fun. This is about keeping the ones we love safe, and that's a pretty good reason to do it. Do you have a follow-up, Claudia? Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Are there any additional precautions that people who are traveling should be taking or businesses that are hosting travelers? Well, with respect to the businesses, um, and you see this uh, all over the place, and it's important to businesses. Uh, certainly people, for example, in the restaurant industry talk to me about the importance of the rules and the importance for them and following the rules and demonstrating to people who would come that it's safe to come and that their concern for their customers is high. And that has uh, certainly been the experience around BC. So there, it's following the rules. But when you're traveling, I think it's understanding where you're going and being respectful of where you go. It's possible in this province to, this uh, incredible province to travel around and do so safely and show the same uh, respect we would show to our family members that we show to people we're visiting and one of the many communities people may want to visit. So I think it's about understanding that while we're on vacation, we're not in, on vacation from our responsibilities with respect to COVID-19. Next question is from Colton Davies, Radio NL. Hi, this question is for uh, Minister Dix and uh, CEO Brown. Um, 
this outbreak happened, as we know, uh, days after we moved to phase three, which allows for increased provincial travel, as everyone knows. So is that in itself an extra cause for concern uh, in this uh, Kelowna outbreak? And does this make the government consider at all uh, backtracking on some of our reopening plans? Thank you. Well, I think the reopening plans have been based on the science, and it's been from a systematic, methodical process from day one, based on the evidence we see, and that's how we're acting. We're going to continue to follow the, that path, and if we follow the rules, if we see ourselves following the rules, and we, and we uh, understand what they are, and as businesses, uh, people follow the rules, and as government and everyone else, then we're going to be, I think, able to continue to sustain travel around BC and that that will be a good thing. You know, I think the, the, the challenge is that we're going to be dealing, as you know, with this for months and months and months. So we have to understand that while we've done very well in BC, we cannot become complacent. We can't ever become complacent. And that's especially important. You know, people want to, I, I understand, and, and, and there's enormous reasons to want to travel this beautiful province in this beautiful summer that we're having. Uh, but when we do that, we can't be on vacation uh, from our responsibilities. And on a further note, I'd say with respect to, because this is within BC and, uh, and within Canada, that we have to continue, I think, uh, that our restrictions on international travel uh, that are needless to say going to have to continue. And people often talk about that with respect to borders and American tourists, for example, coming here or from elsewhere. That's true of Canadians traveling to the United States. Neither is possible right now given the circumstances in the United States. And so uh, we continue uh, to strongly advocate uh, for an extension of the of the of the ban on visitors either way from Canada to the United States and vice versa in the next uh, in the coming uh, uh, weeks and months. Do you have a follow-up Colton? Yeah I suppose I was hoping uh, CEO Brown could comment on that question as well on uh, you know is is this uh, an extra cause for concern in particular the fact that this happened uh, within you know just days of moving to phase three and uh, Minister Dix commented on the borders as well so I'm hoping uh, Susan um, you know there's a lot of at the 49th parallel most of our uh, US borders are within the IHA so I was hoping for your thoughts on um, the borders as well thank you thanks Colton um, I think Minister Dix said it all but uh, we've done very well in the interior and we will continue to do very well We've uh, got a great public health team that are on everything right away. So I think the strength of the team and uh, people being mindful of the rules um, are important. And it's a, the interior of BC is an amazing place to come and visit. So uh, we don't want to discourage people from coming, but we do want people to be mindful of their behavior. We have Thank time you. for one more question, and that is from Adrian Blanc, CBC Radio Canada. Hello, bonjour. Euh, cette question est pour le ministre de la Santé. Euh, vous avez en partie répondu, mais est-ce que vous envisagez d'imposer des restrictions au niveau régional en cas de contagion localisée, euh, comme on le voit à Kelowna, par exemple Oui, premièrement, je, je, veux, je, je vais faire euh, après un résumé de notre euh, annonce aujourd'hui, notre euh, euh, le sujet d'aujourd'hui, qui c'est le, les nouveaux lits de soins. Mais euh, pour la question directe, je dirais, Adrien, que, que la, la situation euh, à Kelowna, on prend euh, cette situation très au sérieux. C'est une situation pas seulement à Kelowna, mais euh, maintenant dans d'autres villes de la province. Chaque fois qu'il y a un incident euh, avec COVID-19, on fait une enquête Euh, de santé à fond, on, on poursuit tout, euh, toute l'évidence et on prend des mesures. Et on l'a vu cette fois-ci avec euh, l'annonce de ce qui s'est passé dans plusieurs euh, euh, endroits, euh, à Kelowna par exemple. Donc on va continuer à faire cela à fond euh, dans les, les semaines et mois à venir parce que c'est essentiel, c'est le travail de la santé publique et c'est essentiel pour ce qu'il euh, euh, qu faut faire pour euh, nous protéger contre le, le, le COVID-19. Je veux dire aujourd'hui qu'on a mis aussi euh, cinq demandes de proposition pour euh, 495 nouveaux lits de soins de longue durée financés par la province. Les DP ont été publiés ce mois-ci. Les résultats seront évalués à l'automne et une décision Euh, sera rendu au début de 2021. 
Euh, on prévoit euh, 140 lits pour le centre de l'Okanogan à Kelowna, 100 à Kamloops, 90 à Vernon, 90 à Penticton et 75 à Nelson. L'emplacement exact des lits sera déterminé dans le cadre de, du processus d'appel d'offres. Et votre question supplémentaire? Oui, euh, simplement j'aimerais savoir qu'est-ce qu'il euh, qu qu en est des centres de soins de longue durée. Euh, à quel moment est-ce qu'on saura si les visites peuvent être étendues? Excusez-moi, j'ai raté la... la... Euh, concernant les centres de soins de longue durée, les long-term care homes, oui, oui. euh, est-ce qu'on est sur la bonne piste pour euh, permettre plus de visites? Oui, on a commencé avec des visites euh, euh, la semaine dernière et on va avoir un rapport sur le progrès euh, jeudi euh, de cette semaine. Mais euh, force est de reconnaître qu'on a commencé à faire des visites, euh, que ces visites euh, sont nécessaires, mais il faut être prudent et on va continuer à être prudent. On va faire... Euh, euh, une analyse de ces visites, des risques, etc., continuels. Et il se peut qu'on qu ajoute des visites euh, ou des gens qui euh, puissent visiter dans les, euh, dans les mois à venir. Mais pour le moment, ça va être une personne pour chaque résident. Et il y aura des limites importantes en termes de, de, de règlement pour qu'on puisse garder la santé de tout le monde. Thank you very much. Thank Merci you. beaucoup.